Welcome to another episode of the Raw Barbell Club podcast. If you're new to our channel, welcome. And if you're a returning viewer, guys, I'm so glad to have you back. If you have any comments or questions about this episode, please leave them below and make sure you click that subscribe button just down here and click that notification tab so you get updates on when our next episode is out. Hey guys, welcome to the Raw Barbell Club podcast. I'm your host, coach, and all around good guy, Andy, and I'm here today with my fill in. <laughs> <laughs> nah, Steve is a good friend of mine. He's a weightlifter, oh, he's a CrossFit coach. He mm. has been a weightlifter in the past. And I'm the only person that doesn't pull out on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a good way to start. <laughs> sure. Um, so you're going on this trip? Yeah. Yeah. Where are you going? So going to the States um, with uni. It's so what do you study again? Uh, sports science, sport exercise science at ACU in Stratford. Are you Catholic? <laughs> That's one for a different day. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mum, if you're listening, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we're going to the States. I fly out at about the end of next month. Um, and we start in Philly and we just sort of travel around, speak to a couple of different coaches from different sporting teams, a couple of institutes as well over there, like the Red Bull <coughs> uh, Performance Center, I think it's called. What's that? I think it's, I actually haven't done much research into it myself. I was looking into a lot of the, like who the, some of who the coaches, strength and conditioning coaches and stuff were with the teams that we were seeing. Um, that has always been sort of a realm that I'm semi-interested in moving into eventually. Um, like s &C stuff? s &C stuff. With um, sports teams? Yeah, but particularly with American sports, just because, I guess, as far as money for effort goes, there's a lot more money over there than there is here. They just pour a lot more money into sport. Than and we don't do. have a big s &C culture here, right? It's No, like not really. Not in sport either, yeah. Everyone likes spending field time. No one likes spending time in the gym. Yeah, correct. Which is ridiculous because that's half the reason why we're so behind everyone else. Like I remember um, having mm, a conversation mm. with, or maybe I was even listening to a podcast with Ashley Jones, who is a strength and conditioning coach. Um, he's worked with a couple of Aussie teams, but he's worked with the Crusaders and the All Blacks as yeah. well in the past. And like just listening to him talk about how much gym work like the forwards do in New Zealand like it's no wonder that they're so much more dominant than us in like in the pack so like in scrums and rucked, rucks and mauls and that sort of thing yeah that's interesting how do you train your like if you had a, a rugby team how would you mm. train them seeing as this is something that you actually study and, mm. and are a part of uh, what part of the season like in season pre-season Pre-season? Pre-season's fun. In-season's like, uh, don't get them hurt. Yeah, I, I think in-season's in season's funny because everyone, like, I had this conversation with one of my tutors a couple of weeks ago and um, how a lot of, when you speak to head coaches, all they want for in-season is maintenance of speed, strength, fitness, but like you said, don't get them hurt. But I think that you can, if monitored properly, you can make sure people don't get hurt and still make gains in those areas, if that makes sense. I agree. It's just better monitoring, that's all it is. Because like, a big problem we see as well is that like people lose a bunch of weight in season because they're not you know, uh, eating and training uh, in the gym as much, right? And they get like, yeah, super exactly. skinny and weak. And yeah. Um, that's probably why they get injured. For sure. Like you see, one that I was having a conversation with Beck the other day that... Um, Who's Beck? Oh. Don't know why. Um, but we're having a conversation so the other Be day. Beck is our friend. She's an exercise physiologist. She actually trains here as well and owns a gym just down the corner. Yeah. Fun, fast fitness, if mm. you guys are looking for it. Don't go there. No, <laughs> no she's good. <laughs> um, but I was having a conversation with her the other day about strength and like, so in the NRL at the moment, we're seeing a lot of like non contact ACL injuries um, and a lot of stuff around the knee. So where it's not during a tackle, it's not like they haven't been hit, uh, they're not falling awkwardly, they just go to change direction, uh, either to put a step on, or even you'll see just to accelerate from a flat foot, um, and you see MCL or ACL go pretty regularly this year. Like it seems like almost every week we've had one, 
um, and we were just talking about whether if that's either poor pre-season where they weren't strong enough coming into the season or um, poor maintenance throughout the season of strength because really non-contact stuff it is pretty avoidable like it shouldn't happen most of the time why do you think um, it is happening weak hamstrings like I don't think people are strong enough and it's because people are very much scared to work the hamstrings in season um, in running dominant sports just because there's so many strains um, and because it hurts like yeah. Entering doms is the worst. Oh, exactly, yeah. But also just like when you do get into the monitoring side of it, like guys that use a lot of monitoring talk about making sure your hamstring load is quite low throughout the season just because when you do get to that on-field, all those accelerations are a hamstring-dominant movement, right? Mm. Like taking off is hamstring-dominant. Um, but does that potentially allow for it to get a little bit weaker throughout the season? And as we get to this back end, that's when we start to see a lot more knee injuries. Um, is that just general fatigue as well? Um, like they're in round, don't know what round they're in now, but they have 26 rounds to play throughout the year in the NRL. Um, are they just getting to that point where they're getting tired on the field as well? Are they not well rested enough? But I think a lot of it would come down to that hamstring strength. Because I mean, that's what yeah. especially the ACL does, right? The ACL stops, um, the ACL stops the tibia from moving forward, right? And the hamstring does the exact same thing. So if the hamstring's a little bit stronger and it can react that little bit faster, then you're not requiring the ACL to do as much work. And I think if that's getting weak throughout the season, because they're not working it, then maybe that's something that needs to be looked into and we need to be a little bit less worried about the amount of volume we put on and a little bit more worried about the strength loss mm. there. So like pre-season, you're looking at really building up a whole bunch of capacity in that hamstring. Yep. And then, yep. especially with your training, and then yeah. trying to maintain not the hamstring strength, but maintaining that capacity. Even. Yeah, yeah. And especially, um, it's not even just playing strength because, I mean, obviously, accelerating, decelerating, changing direction is a very dynamic movement. It happens quickly. Um, so a lot of it needs to be reactive stuff as well. So it's not just how heavy can you pull, like can you do a Nordic, can you do a Nordic? It's not just that stuff. It's also training that change of direction stuff, even under load, um, single leg stuff stuff that's reactive to even gameplay like catching a ball um, on one leg um, there's some drills that you can do just to work that reactive strength as well um, but I feel like once we get in season unless it's already a rehab thing because they've had previous issues it seems to be a little bit neglected because um, they're trying to avoid overloading which I understand but at the same time you got to wonder whether if you're trading off uh, one for the other mm. you know what I mean like maybe it is a catch-22 maybe it's just hamstring injuries are a way of life in sport like that but it's also such a common injury that you've got to wonder whether if there is a more we could be doing about it yeah and I mean I saw like a whole bunch of people and strength coaches riding or speed coaches I don't know everyone has like their own title nowadays yeah but like writing about you know how specialists yeah, yeah. you know generic strength <coughs> exercises like squat pressing deadlifts mm. yeah um, aren't are the reason why we're not we're getting all these ACL injuries and I yeah. read that and I was like oh you know like maybe not maybe there's something deeper going on do you think there could be a part of it could be uh, a lack of like movement quality as well yeah, like people 100%. aren't like <clears throat> I see I see kids coming into the gym and stuff mm. and I'm like oh you know, no one really taught you how to walk properly or run yeah. properly or well how often do you see someone come into the gym and they can't like we had the conversation the other day, they can't hip hinge. Mm. Like it takes time to teach someone to hip hinge. Whereas for people who are active from a young age, like that's not really a crazy thing to learn because they understand their body. But when you're talking about that as well with poor movement coordination, what we're talking about is in general, these are kids that have like, these are guys that played sport their whole age. So they're probably pretty movement coordinated. But see, that's the thing. Like I have, I have people that come in as like 17 year olds, 20 year olds, mm. 21 year olds that played rugby mm. and they have mm. poor movement quality. Mm. So like- Do you think that's low level sport them. where people just didn't pick up on it because they- it Could be. Like, like you have poor coaches in poor you have, grades, right? You have people that get to a high level with weird movement issues. For sure, yeah. That, and that's what I'm bringing up. I'm like, I wonder if just as a whole, the reason that we're seeing more of these things mm. are because of the the 
mechanisms behind mechanisms it. behind yeah. it rather than like just a general strand. Yep. Yeah, I think you definitely argue that. I, w- I wouldn't disagree with it. I mean, like in the gym, you can <clears throat> train someone to squat well, but when they go out and run, like if they're doing some weird, like you know, over pronation of the foot or mm. you know, letting mm. that knee track so medially mm. whenever they change direction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I know I think, there is. Going to be I think movement specialists and like biomechanics, especially, is growing in the sporting field. Like it's something that was pretty ignored for a long time. Um, or maybe not even ignored, just wasn't understood well enough, didn't have the technology to really break it down as much as we can. Um, and you see it even now, like in weightlifting, like people that have, like, there's a hundred different apps or softwares out there now that can break down um, joint angles, like bar path, bar speed, um, all into one big picture with it all on the screen in front of you. It's very easy to see now. There's a lot of numbers that I can't interpret myself, but like, someone who knows what they're doing, all of a sudden now that's potentially a big part of elite level lifting, whereas I think maybe beforehand it wasn't. So maybe in 20 years time, now that we have all that research, we have all that stuff, all that technology, <clears throat> maybe we'll see in the elite levels of the NRL, for example, or rugby union, that those things will be used because it will have been used from a younger grade. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like it yeah. will come through with the players. Um, and there's definitely an issue as well where clubs in particular who are run by older heads are going to really struggle to bring in new age stuff because it's always what they're doing has always worked for them so they're very i guess um what's the word to change um they don't want to change and and we should probably add the caveat that like neither of us we're we're talking as outsiders we're not actually sure yeah yeah. physically in the space we're just sort of commenting on things that we're can notice from the outside yeah yeah for sure oh yeah i haven't like i haven't spent enough time in around elite teams to know exactly what they're doing but from like obviously talking to people that have spent that time with elite teams like there's plenty of guys from the uni that lecture there and stuff that work with these teams and just know what they're talking about but shake their head at their head coach because the head coach doesn't want to listen to research because he's always made his players run up sand hills for however long um, I see that that's something that is so funny to me that I look at you know the the way some of the even the lower level teams train and I'm like what why did you do that for two hours yeah absolutely no reason at all um, I <laughs> I won't say his name but there's a fairly good lecturer or at least he's coached at a fairly high level um, and he's very data based very like research based sort of thing um, that has said that to me a few times like teams aren't necessarily overly specific because when these coaches came through they were potentially there wasn't the research there Mm. so that's what they did it worked for them then it's still kind of working for them now so they just keep doing it Um, there's not a whole lot of there's still drills that make no sense going around like if you look at that makes no sense to you a drill that makes no sense so if you have a look at the not even drills so you have a look at the nrl right so you say rugby league um if you go through like a movement analysis or a game analysis of rugby league majority of the sprints that happen or majority of the movement that takes place is between like five and 15 meters like there's not much long distance running And there's certainly never anything longer than the length of the field, right? So even assuming the fullback makes an intercept and runs the length, (laughs) the furthest he's going to run is 102 metres, right? Like he's not going to run any further than that. So why do we have players doing a two and a half kilometre time trial? Like it doesn't... And that's where, like, there is there an argument you can make to it? Sure, like someone can come in and say, well, it's just an aerobic capacity test, okay? Two and a half Ks. But can you not get players doing that same aerobic capacity test with something that happens over shorter intervals like the yo-yo test, which is 20 metres out, 20 metres back, walk around a cone? That's pretty, a lot closer to what happens in a game than doing a two and a half kilometre test because no one runs two and a half kilometres straight in a game. The whistles have been blown 20 times before they get to that point. Yeah. Um, but it's still something that's used as their fitness test because that's what they used 30 years ago. Hmm. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. It is weird. It is weird, but I think it will gradually fall away out of the game Um, because I think you've probably still got strength coaches in there that haven't done a degree. They were a strength coach 20 years ago before sport and exercise science or a master's in high performance or EP 
or anything like that were big fields. Yeah. Um, there wasn't many of them around. I don't even think exercise science was a thing 20 years ago. Um, and I think potentially Australia might be one of the only countries that actually <coughs> offer specifically exercise sports science. I think they do it in the States. Okay. I think they do do it in the States, um, but it may be called something different, but pretty much the same, same over there. Huh. Mm. So going back to how you were structuring <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the program for... Pre-season. Pre-season. So pre-season um, is mainly, I would say, especially at the start of the pre-season, you're looking at trying to build strength. For a sport like rugby or NRL, rugby league, um, you're trying to build up a player's strength. So as a whole, because I think it's very hard to program individually in a 20-man squad outside of maybe minute points. Well, that's um, why I think sometimes a lot of these like big runs and stuff came about because it is really easy to get a whole bunch of people to, to go do that for a stuff. 3K run. Yeah, for sure. Um, so you're probably going to have a base program of which all players in the field need. Um, so that's like your hamstring strength for injury um, and speed. Your, everyone needs to wrestle in rugby league because everyone needs to be able to wrestle over the ball. Um, same as rugby union, they all need to be able to wrestle over the ball. If we talk about rugby union um, scrums, players need to be crazily strong through the posterior um, and then also very strong through the quads just to make sure that they can actually drive through the scrum as well. Um, and if we add AFL into there, people need to be able to have a huge amount of explosive strength to exactly. jump, catch. Yeah. So it's very sport specific. The start is definitely a focus on strength. You might have a small bit of a hypertrophy phase in there. Um, but majority of the players are not going to be, um, I guess, at the point where their strength is outweighing, their strength is hitting that potential for their size, if that makes sense. Mm. So like we know that you'll come to a point with the amount of mass that you have that you can't really get much stronger because you can't densen the fibres any further. So you need to get bigger, build some more fibres or build bigger fibres and then work back through the strength phase again. I don't really think in a sport where there's such a cardiovascular component that they're ever going to be at that point where they're too strong for their size. And there's also, so so some people might not realise there's actually like three basic ways that we get stronger, right? Mm. There's uh, building... Build mass. Build mass. Yeah. Uh, increasing the density of the fibres, cross-sectional yep. fibres. Yeah. And then the last is just like a neurological, learning yep. how to move better. Correct. So yep. as you get more efficient, as you get more motor units firing, yep. you're going to be And that's to... where newbie, ga newbie gains comes from, yeah. right? Like that's why you see people put 60 kilos on their squat within the first six weeks at the gym. That's just because their body is learning to use the muscles that move the joints better. Mm. And um, a really funny one to see is like someone who is trying to bench press for the first time mm. ever. And, and shake. They can't, yeah, they shake uncontrollably yeah. with the MTR. Yeah. And then next week they're like, oh, 30 kilos, whatever. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, for sure. Um, what were we saying? Um, uh, I, you were talking about to. they would get to a stage where... Uh, th sorry, they, they get not they're never really get. getting to that stage yet. So I guess the hypertrophy phase is definitely not pointless because I think that high rep stuff um, at the start of pre-season can be really good just for avoiding injury through the rest of the season, just with like um, connective tissue, um, making sure like your tendons and ligaments and stuff are ready to deal with that much weight. Which is what um, we're, the problem that we're discussing with, is, right? yeah. Um, but not even necessarily like doing that for, I guess, the in-season stuff that we're talking about when we're talking about ACL and hamstring injuries, but also just having the tendon and ligament strength to deal with then really loading up for things like five threes and ones yeah. um, for then our more strength-based stuff. So I think it would be, it's definitely prudent to make sure you do have some sort of a hypertrophy phase at the start of pre-season. Um, Even then for adaption's sake, right? For sure, yeah. Because like, things get stale, people start exactly stop actually uh, doing the thing that you want them to For do. Sure. Yeah, and just motivation, like like you said. Um, so then once you've phased out hypertrophy, you're looking at moving into a very, very strength dominant phase where we're just looking at building the amount of weight that a player can lift, um, building the capacity they have in their muscles for moving load. Um, and then that then comes back to as well that injury prevention as well. If you're stronger, um, it's generally harder to get injured when you're a little bit stronger. Um, ligaments, there's not as much strain put on the ligaments that are there to stop bones moving the way that they shouldn't, if that makes sense. So the muscles are all there. I try and think about it um, 
where the muscles are there to stop things. The muscles are a second resort, um, like the ligaments, for, like the ACL, like we're talking about, it stops that translation forward of the tibia. Um, if the ACL can't deal with the amount of load, we've got a hamstring there that should be able to stop it from happening. Like if we didn't have any hamstrings, we'd see a significantly, well, firstly, you wouldn't be able to stand up, but we'd see a lot more issues around the ACL as well if we didn't have hamstrings there to help out. Mm. Um, so building that load, building that strength helps there as well. And then when you're moving into the next phase where we talk about, then you've probably got like, I would personally break it up where you come from your hypertrophy into like hypertrophy strength, then into like strength, strength power where strength is still sort of your focus, but you're starting to move into power work. And that's where then we start talking about how fast a player can move. So that's where coming into in season, we want our players to be faster. You want them to be able to take off faster, slow down faster, um, change direction faster, more efficiently. And we know power is force times acceleration, right? So you can, the more weight you can move, the more potential you have to be fast. How far removed from like the sports specific stuff would you get? Uh, in like, would you in get them? Work? Would you, you get them like far out when you're doing your hypertrophy work? Would you still get them? You know, maybe uh, running around on the field or whatever still, or would you just be like, no, you know, we're not touching a ball for all this time. No, you still have to. Um, you still have to get them doing sports specific stuff. But you wouldn't get them playing Oz Tag in the off season. No, no. <laughs> um, but you still need players moving around, not even just for, I guess. A, they still need to be moving around because you don't really want players coming into the back quarter of preseason being unfit slobs. That's then a massive base. That you, like you don't have a base to work from anymore if they haven't done anything for three months, right? Um, so you still want to maintain a little bit of a base, but as far as gym work is, I guess, what I was talking about. But yeah, you definitely still need to A, maintain a fitness base and then just skills as well. Like rugby league, for example, or rugby union is a very high skill sport. Like, players need the coordination. You can leave it there if you want. I just didn't want it to vibrate and bugger me. Um, and then, oh, I lost my train of thought now. Sorry. <laughs> That's right. Um, the, it's a high skill sport, so coordination is something that they're not going to lose it in three months, but it certainly can get rusty. Yeah. Like, you know yourself, if you can't go overhead for two months and then you get given the all clear to go overhead, doing a squat snatch feels spastic for the first couple of reps right yeah, for sure. it's the same thing like you don't want to go okay we're a week out from season um before first trial matches now let's start throwing a ball around again because um, it's just not going to work out as well for them um, i just think the load needs to be more predominantly in the gym and then as you get closer to the season that needs to transition to more predominantly on the field and that depends on the sport as well like we're talking about rugby or um rugby league like I think other sports are different. Um, sports like soccer, for example. Soccer, I think, is requires probably significantly more coordination and significantly more skills than rugby. Um, so they probably need to spend a lot more time on the field still maintaining those skills, especially when you look at the fact that the difference in soccer between the best player in the world and the second best player in the world is generally skill level. It's not necessarily fitness or speed like they're all pretty much around the same mark mm. um, yeah it makes sense so they need to be better with their feet really well, i feel like that's why sports like puts on stuff come along right yeah something for them to work on in the off season for sure. the problem is they become so competitive in themselves that they get injured again anyway yeah <clears throat> for sure and also a sport like soccer there's not contact that you're dealing with as well and that's another reason why you need to be super strong in sports like rugby is again just resisting poor movement when you're getting hit yeah. like and having that little bit more mass on your body is certainly helping with that little bit more padding as well like it doesn't can't hurt to have a little bit of extra mass there when you're getting belted cushion for the pushing yeah correct <laughs> <laughs> sure <laughs> uh when you like when we switch to like in season then yeah so i've done all this work and and during that whole time you've had them doing obviously a bunch of like connective tissue work, yep. balance work yep. and that sort of stuff. So, so they're primed to move quite well. Yep. What does the in season look like? Connective tissue and balance is still probably your number one priority. 
um, only because I think when you get to in season, as far as gym work goes, majority of it does need to be injury prevention. Yeah, that's what you're looking at. Um, that's why, like we said earlier, um, head coaches are not necessarily looking for players to get stronger, faster, fitter during the season. They're just looking to reduce the amount of drop off that they have. Like you'll see, whether if it's fatigue related or lack of gym training, you'll see from round one to round 26, players are generally playing round 26 or the finals less fit than they were in round one because um, they have less training time. They're having days off after games, days off before the game, um, days off after big training sessions, lighter days, recovery days, um, as opposed to during the preseason where it's like heavy day, light day, heavy day, light day, rest day, heavy day, light day. You know what I mean? Like they're not having so many days off and then they have a game day as well where they go get their bodies beaten up for 80 minutes and it's not really training like it's mm. game day so it's different um so i think during the season we want to try and maintain that stuff for the gym but we also need to be doing stuff that's stopping people getting injured and that's why i think strength work is still important because if we're not doing the strength work people are losing strength and then they're getting injured more often because of lack of strength um rather than they're getting injured because of poor movement, yeah. Okay, but that's probably one thing that does get maintained pretty well throughout the season because they're moving all the time. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And so what sort of stuff would you have them do then? Would it be like... For like for training, like are you still having them squat? Are you going to be like, yeah, oh, I'm you know what, we're not going to do a whole bunch of uh, slow eccentric work. We're only going to do move concentrically and things yeah, like that. Yeah, that's... I actually can't remember the coach's name. I know we spoke about it the other day. But I think that's a really cool theory. So we know there's more fiber breakdown with eccentric movement, right? So that's where DOMS predominantly can come from. So for people doing like a, you know, uh, like a, a chest fly or something where you Yeah, like that slow eccentric is what makes you really sore. And it's also the stretch into full range, which... Oh, probably an RDL is a, a better example. An RDL, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's that slow eccentric that is really especially under a stretch, right? Like there's a slow eccentric, under a stretched muscle. Full range. Full range, like that's where, I guess, soreness is coming from. So the theory that we were talking about, um, as I said, I can't remember the coach's name. I think he's a college coach. He's definitely a college coach. He might be Texas U, I think, in the States for the NFL. Or um, well, sorry for gridiron. But he has been playing with doing only eccentrics with his players. So um, the one he talks about the most is because everyone's obsessed with it at the moment, is the hex bar. Um, yeah. So hex bar deadlift. Why is everyone obsessed with hex bar deadlifts? Um, I have two. <laughs> you have two. Yeah, you had three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I might soon have three again. I can't stop buying them. <laughs> <laughs> I have a problem. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know why people are crazy obsessed with them. I mean, I guess I understand where the... Uh, like where the fantasy is coming from and that's like the players are probably less likely to get injured doing well, a hex e bar deadlift than e a regular e deadlift. To, easy to learn. It's easy to learn. Low skill. It's harder to get in a poor position. Um, easier to load. Low, easier to load. You can generally lift heavier. Um, but I think where people are maybe falling, going wrong a little bit is they're falling into the trap of the hex bar deadlift is the deadlift substitute. So it's definitely a form of a deadlift. It's definitely very similar, but I think when the hip angle changes and the knee angle changes as much as it does, it's no longer doing the same things that a deadlift is doing. So if you're programming a deadlift for that like lengthened hamstring position and being strong in that lengthened position, I think as soon as you bend your knees to get down into almost a squat position to pick up a hex bar, you're no longer training the same thing. Yeah, um, I think people go, oh, let's do hex bar deadlifts because it's nicer on my player's back um, than doing an actual deadlift. But then you're not actually, you're not really doing what a deadlift is supposed to do. Mm. A deadlift is is actually a form of mechanical disadvantage. The Correct. bar yeah. is in front of the body. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas the hex bar brings the weight to yeah. to your center of mass. Yeah, exactly. So I guess, I mean, you could look at it the other way and you say, okay, in a deadlift... 45 to 50% of the load is going through your hamstring glute. Um, but then, and in a hex bar, you could say it's a little bit less than that. Maybe it's only 35%, but maybe because you're able to load it up more, maybe it works out similar, if that yeah. makes sense. Um, you could argue that, 
but at the same time, if it's loading it up sim light, why don't you just do a deadlift? True. Um, and also, I think one of, like you said, is a mechanical disadvantage, but one of the cool things about deadlift is you are quite often in a very lengthened position for your hamstring. Your hamstring is often quite lengthened. There's not much knee bend. There's a fair bit of hip flexion. Um, so that hammy is really long and you're really training that end range. And the cool thing about that, and that's why so many sprinters and stuff do so many Romanian deadlifts, is because when you're sprinting or taking off or trying to run fast, you're stretching right out with your foot, right? So your hamstring's in an extremely lengthened position. When it contacts the ground, you drag back. That's a lot of force going through the hammy in that lengthened position. Um, so if you're training it for that reason, which most strength coaches, I don't think many strength coaches would disagree that deadlifts are great for speed, right? For being fast. Um, if you're still using the hex bar for that same reason, thinking we're using it for speed work um, or to get faster in the same way that we do when we do deadlifts, I think you're probably a little bit deluded because it doesn't work the same way. You're not necessarily training the same range um, that you are when you're doing RDLs or normal deadlifts. Yeah. That if makes that makes sense. sense. Do you, what do you think the role of the quad is in a sprint? Deceleration. Yeah. J breaking force. Breaking force. Yeah. Yeah. That's all, that's really all it is. Because the hex um, bar is like very quaddy. Hex bar is super quaddy, right? So super important for breaking, which is fine. Um, like at the end of the day, when you're running at full speed, it's not like you can afford to have weak quads. It's not like I'm saying that the quads do nothing in a sprint. All I'm saying is they're not the propelling force, they're the braking force. If you had no quad strength every time your foot, if you, your, your foot, ugh, if your foot contacted the ground with that much load at that much speed, like you'd have some serious issues, right? Like you'd probably do a PCL. Mm -hmm. Which is not something that you see a lot of in no, field exactly. sports. No, exactly. But that's because in field sports, players as a general rule have pretty strong quads. Yeah. Um, I think we see even just on... Why is it that the hamstrings are so weak? Good question. I actually don't have an answer for you there. I think a lot of stuff that we do in daily life is much more quad dominant. Um, so I think people as like a whole, walking downstairs, walking downstairs, taking walking elevators down. upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to walk your <laughs> um, But yeah, I think I think it's probably general life is the biggest thing. Like I think from a young age, we're probably much more quad dominant, and even um, driving. Probably quad dominant. It's calf dominant. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Depends how you drive. Yeah. Uh, if you're driving really short in the seat. Um, I think, yeah, I don't know, like walking, for example, like everyone walks, it's the first thing you learn to do after you crawl, right? Like you learn to walk, and then most of us tend to walk everywhere we go. Walking is surprisingly a much more quad dominant movement. Like a walk is really just a controlled fall, so all you're doing is braking every time you. Mm. Fall forward, you break. You fall forward, you break. You fall forward, you break. So, from a young age, our quads are developing. Whereas I think the hamstrings are something that are allowed to be neglected, um, just in daily life, activities of daily life. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. That's just the theory. I don't actually know why the hamstrings are like. Yeah, that's just what's going on in your head. Yeah, that's what's going on in my head as soon as you ask me. Yeah. Mm. How do you program? Oh yeah, sorry. Anyway, tell me more about this trip that we were meant to talk about oh. at the start of the podcast. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so we leave next month, end of next month, flying over to the States. I actually need to book flights and that sort of thing. Um, but so you're gonna do it right now? Yeah, no, I'm gonna <laughs> get up where we're going. Um, but yeah, so we get to go over to the States. The uni organized it, it's pretty cool. Um, it's super exciting, man. When you first told me about this, I was like, Holy crap, that's like, you have to get on this trip. Cause there was the, like you, there was a thing that you had to actually like, Yeah, you had to apply. Right? You had to have like a decent resume. You had to have a decent enough GPA. The GPA wasn't too much of a, like, it wasn't a crazy GPA. It was like- Cause you're a genius. <laughs> no, I have a horrible GPA, no. Um, but it's just like, it wasn't massively high. You know what I mean? Like it was below a credit. It was yeah. like just bordering, teetering on a credit. Um, but it was also the, um, like you had to write a, give them a resume and write like a letter as to why it would be beneficial to you to go on this tour and then they chose 16 students from that, um, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, as soon as I saw it, I sort of um and ah about it for a little while, uh, just from going away from training for a little while, going away from work for a little while, 
um, spending that much money to go over to the States for not a holiday. Mm. Um, but well, the, to me, this seems like the best holiday. It is the best holiday, yeah. Like, it's a field that I'm extremely interested in. Um, and it's get to go over and talk to and see some of the best do it. Um, and this could be your breaking moment. You could go there and be like, you know what, maybe this is actually not what I want to do with the rest of my life. Exactly, yeah, like for sure. It could also be like, wow, I really want to work in the States. Um, but don't leave. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so we get to go over. I think I fly into, I got to get over to Philly. I don't know whether if I have to do a connecting flight to get to Philly, but that's where we start. We go to a couple of teams in Philly. Um, like we go West see Philadelphia. Sorry. Are you going to West Philadelphia? I don't know. You were born and raised. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't even pick up where that was going. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we go speak to I think the coaches and staff, coaching staff with a couple of NBA teams or over there, a couple of NFL teams. Go spend a bit of time at a college over there as well, or two or three colleges, I think. Um, we go to Vegas for, I think, one night where I won't be doing any study. Um, <laughs> one night in Vegas? Yeah, one night. Um, Better be the best night. Yeah. Have you been to Vegas before? No, and I'm not sure that they'll take me back after this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so we go to Vegas. We go to, I think it's the UFC Institute in Vegas, which um, seems pretty cool. Like, I don't know a whole bunch about it. Um, I don't follow the UFC that closely. Um, interesting but i don't really understand i haven't really looked into i guess what they do at the at the institute yeah um, like i'm actually interested to see what the institute is all about because obviously fighters as a general rule have their own coaches and their own strength coaches and stuff so it's not like they're going over to the institute to do all their training mm. um so i'm curious as to what the point of it is in general why it exists why it exists um i do know that the ufc has like its own like funded rehabilitation programs and that sort of thing um, for fighters. So like if a high class fighter gets seriously injured, then the UFC will pay sports doctors and stuff to look after them. So that could be what it's there for. It could be like more of a rehab center rather than um, a training facility, yeah. I guess. Um, but as I said, I haven't looked into it, so I'm just spitballing. Um, yeah, and then we go to LA, I uh, go see the Rams. Uh, in Philly, we get to see the uh, 76ers, which is pretty cool. Very um, cool. Very cool. I've taken a bit of an interest in basketball in the last couple of years, so that'd be cool. To go I think you were say in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> nah, last couple of years, so it'd be cool to go and... Um, Play for them. <laughs> yeah, it'd be cool to go get on the court, uh, get some court time. But uh, no, it'd be cool to go and have a chat or at least watch how some of the coaches and stuff operate over there. Yeah. I think the States, because of the amount of money they pour into their sport, I think it attracts a, it attracts a lot of coaches, but then it mm -hmm. also attracts a lot of high quality coaches. So it'd be yeah. interesting to like a lot of the um, mm -hmm. manuals and theories and stuff that a lot of us look to, um, mm -hmm. like I think Cal Dietz and that sort of thing. Like um, a lot of them have spent time in the American Cal, Cal Dietz is like triphasic training. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, like a lot of us, a lot of them have spent time in the American system. Yeah. Um, so a lot of their methods that a lot of coaches over here or in other countries look to as um, like not a gold standard, but as a tool in their repertoire um, comes from coaches that have worked over there. So I'd be curious to see what's different compared to how coaches over here operate, especially. Mm. Um, and even just different theories that different coaches have. Like I'm sure we, like both of us have stuff that isn't proven that we found works well for us. Um, that we still use. Um, and I'd just say they probably have the same thing over there. What do you think about triphasic? Um, it's cool. It's a cool theory. Like, I like it more to the idea of timed efforts. Like, more to the point where he talks a lot about using, like, in, his, in NFL players, for example, talks a lot about saying if a play lasts X seconds, I think it's like eight to 12 seconds as a general rule of thumb for offensive linemen or defensive linemen, then um, to say that most of their reps should happen around that time frame rather than necessarily giving them a rep scheme, give them a time to hit reps. Yeah, um, so like instead. you have this amount of time. Yeah, so we're gonna load you up at 75% 
you have 12 seconds to get as many reps out as you can. If you get four reps out in 12 seconds, cool. Um, and then I guess there's the other way, of, like the other time thing that I found really interesting, um, and that's just talking it's about... It's so popular. Uh, I know, it's a problem. <laughs> um, just talking about uh, speed training, which is yeah. really cool. I can't even... I'm having a mind blank on the coach's name that's been really pushing for it lately. Um, he's written a lot of the manuals and stuff for it. In the States? No, here. Oh. I think he's from over here. I um, can't remember his name. I think we produce a lot of good coaches in Australia, I think. And I think it's because, like you said, we were one of the first or maybe even the first to really set up like a university degree designed for people who want to move into that sort of S&C field. Yeah. Um, not that it's designed purely for that. It's an undergrad for a lot of other things as well. But I think a lot of people that do get into that course, that's why they're doing it. Um, and then they can move into... Or they didn't get into physio. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. For sure, it's definitely a gateway for that one. <laughs> um, it's not a hard course to get into, um, but it's pretty cool. It's interesting. I like to think of exercise science. I say to exercise science about exercise science that it's like your GP degree of the sporting world. Like they know a little bit about most things. Oh, it's like the um, arts of the sporting they, world. Yeah, but they don't really specialize. Sorry, in the anything. arts of the health. World. Yeah, yeah. They don't really specialize in anything. They just know a little bit about everything. Yeah. Um, in the sporting world, anyway. And that's cool too, because it gives you an avenue to go to grow. Because the the hard thing about a lot of degrees, and you know, that's why this degree might be better off, better suited to a country like America, mm. where most people have to do post grad. Like Australia doesn't have a Peace huge. The mic, bro. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Australia doesn't have a huge culture of post grad studies. You know, you no. do an undergrad and then you're ready to work. Yeah. Yeah. So in a country where you know, postgrads kind of. I. I don't know whether it's my personal preference or just like me being lazy and not wanting to do more years at uni, but I think a lot of the time, if you're coming through an undergrad, that gives you a pathway to get into a job. So, exercise science, for example, like that gives me a pathway to get into um, working in the sporting world as an SNC coach. I think a lot of the time, your postgrad is your upskill. Yeah. If that makes sense. So you're already in the field. Um, you want to upskill a little bit, you want to learn a little bit more, maybe you want a couple more letters on your resume. Either way, um, a lot of the time, I think that postgrad can be used as that later movement once you've had five, six years industry experience that makes as sense. well. But um, what, no, what, what I meant by what I was saying was that in America, it's not like that. It's no, like yeah, you yeah. don't have your postgrad, that means every everyone in the dog has their undergrad. Like Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, the States is also ridiculous as far as like college and stuff goes with money and that sort of thing. Like they don't have a good um, system set up for people to pay off debt and they don't have a good system. Well, it's not government sponsored, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and even just their costs over there are ridiculous compared to ours. Like I think, I don't know exactly what the number is, but a three year undergrad is going to leave someone with like what, a thirty-five, forty thousand dollars debt over here? Over there, like, they're looking at a couple hundred K. Holy crap. Like, it's ridiculous. And that's US as well. Like, yeah. Like, we're talking about Australian dollars going holy crap and then you got to almost double it with the state of the dollar now. What are we at, like 60 cents or something? No, way worse. 50? No, we're almost one to two dollars at the moment. Holy crap. Yeah, that's 50. Yeah, 50. We're almost <laughs> at 50. Sorry, you said 60. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Hey, um... So yeah, that's exciting. Cool yeah, story, I'm bro. super excited. <laughs> yeah, I didn't find 20 bucks, but. <laughs> um, but how do you program? Okay, so this is my problem at the moment. Also my problem my entire coaching career. Mm -hmm. I like box jumps. I like jumping of all sorts. It's very good. Mm. But I always struggle to program them and I, struggle to see a huge carryover to my sport which is weightlifting which there should be a huge carryover but there is a huge carryover like i don't know it's confusing to say but like, how would i you understand what you're saying um jumps 100 percent. i think you have to do jumps like look at how high 
most of like the Chinese weightlifters and stuff jump like that. Yeah, so that's why I bring bring that up. Like, yeah. You see the Koreans, you see the Chinese. Yeah. You they see jump the... all the time. They have ridiculous verticals, ridiculous box jumps. Um, I'm when programming box jumps, not so worried about injury from reactive movement so much as I am worried about actually just an injury from stacking it on a box. Um, oh, I have soft boxes, so that's not as much of an yeah. issue. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you saw a video of me doing a soft box jump, but I still managed to ruin myself. Recently? No, ages ago. Ah. I like got one foot up there and missed the other foot, and then the box fell out from underneath me, <laughs> and I went back, um, which was interesting. But I, I see where you're coming from. Are as you far making as money like, on that video? No, I should though. <laughs> It'd be funny. Um, I see where you're coming from with, I guess. A, from an injury standpoint, I think is what a lot of coaches are worried about. Are you worried about injury with it, really? or is It's that time really? for me is the main thing. Like, they already have to do... My guys have to do so much stuff because I want them to get stronger. I want them to, mm. you know, be good at weightlifting. Do you consider weightlifting more of a strength or a power sport? Power. You consider it more of a power sport? Yeah. That's the definition of power. No. <laughs> um, but well, it's, it's like a... Uh, what do you call it? Like a speed strength sport, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a speed strength sport. Um... It's it's and it's more of a skill than a like so. Yes. Yeah, what yeah. I've what I've realized uh, over my time coaching is that really the best way, and this seems really dumb, but mm. like the best way to get good at weightlifting is to practice weightlifting. Mm. So you if you snatch like every day, then you'll probably get better at the skill of snatching. Mm -hmm. um, but and then you have to get stronger to hold that along, right? But you have yeah. to get stronger, and that's why you have to break it up so that you're not snatching every day. Yeah. So but that's why you need phasic training as well. Yeah. So I guess the reason why I asked whether if you think... Try phasic training. Yeah, try phasic <laughs> <laughs> um, Whether if you um, thought it was more a strength or a power sport is because I think when you look at... If, you call, if you're calling it a power sport, which is fine, we won't go any further into it than that. No, nah, it's a speed strength sport, for which sure. is not like... But speed strength has a uh, speed... Like, okay, even if we call it a speed... Street, speed uh -huh. Even if we call it a speed strength sport, speed strength still has two variables in it, right? Like it has speed and strength. Speed and strength <laughs> yeah. The amount of load that you can lift... I was going to say it differently. The amount of load that you can lift and how fast you can lift it, right? <laughs> Ah, <laughs> shit. <laughs> um, but the amount of how fast you can lift it as well. Yeah. And if box jumps, for example, are good for one thing, it's getting faster. right? Um, and also, there's a guy at my gym, for example, at my CrossFit gym, that um, my mate, oh, you've met him, Dave, um, that I trained with. He's sauntered with us a couple oh, of times. Oh, yeah, yeah. Dave. That guy has a... Don't talk about it. That's fine. He beat me in that challenge we did the other day. That challenge we've been doing for the last 12 weeks. Oh, really? Put on more muscle. I don't trust the skin. That guy is <laughs> built. He's jacked. He's like an Adonis. Yeah. Anyway, he's super strong. Apparently his secret is spinach. <laughs> yeah, heaps of spinach. <laughs> well, I can't remember what it is. Anyway. Um, <laughs> um, so he's super strong, right? And then you look at something like his jerk, for example. Okay, so he's really, really strong. Got a really good overhead press, which... Fine, got a really good squat. Um, or What's it? Can you tell me his numbers? Pretty you know? good. I'm not 100. Ah, okay. Like for what the, for what his numbers are, he should be lifting more. Like he'd be, he'd have a 190 dead. Um, like he'd clean pull 160 and still make it look, ish. Yeah. Yeah. He'd strict press maybe like 80 some kilos, benches like he's got a massive vert horizontal. It's like 135 or something. He's got a good horizontal. Um, he squats strong enough, like his front squats, like 145, one, back squat, like maybe 165, 170. And his positions are good? His positions are fine. Uh, he's probably a little too narrow for my liking, but he's... No, I meant like his like biomechanics. He, oh, his like biomechanics are fine. Yeah. yeah, his biomechanics are fine. And he's mobile yeah. um, for his size, which helps. What? Yeah. What, he has it all? <laughs> yeah. Um, but where... So for, for all his power lifts and his movements... Like his Olympic lifts probably aren't where they should be, mm. right? His snatch maybe is, but is he snatch, green though? Snatch is more. No, he's not. He's been doing oh. it for ages. Okay. But his snatch is probably more of like I think the snatch is a much more skill based movement than the clean, for example. Um, and I think his clean and particularly his jerk is behind where it should be. And I think we talk about like what the automation phase is, like when you're trying to turn the bar around in a jerk, for example. So you, you dip, 
and then it's that turnaround time, right, where you hit the bottom of your dip and then you're trying to drive out. He's so slow. Mm. Like, he almost stops in the bottom for a number of seconds before he changes direction. Like Jack. Yeah, exactly like Jack. But Jack is ridiculously strong. Yeah. So, like, he gets away with it, right? Um, whereas Dave, like, you can see, even when he does a box jump, it's like a slow lower and then comes out of the hole real slow and then the last little bit, he takes off, right? Yeah. Someone like that, I think that's why box jumps are so important. Um, it's changing, it's that reactive change direction in a jump. And when you well. say box jump, like, would you, but wouldn't like a, a drop jump or something be better for him? Because it's like, um, or like even just like a drop. A drop jump or a depth jump? Like absorb and absorb first and then jump or try to be reactive? Uh, absorb first and then jump. Absorb first and then jump? Yeah. No, I don't think it's reactive enough. So you reckon like a depth I, I like think bang. a depth jump would be better, um, but I also think a box jump is fine. Yeah. I don't see the problem with doing a box jump. A box jump's um, starting from that particular load anyway. A box, I don't also don't see an issue with loading box jumps either. Like you put someone in the best to do a box jump, that's fine. Get someone to hold on to dumbbells, dumbbells and do a box jump. You know, it doesn't have to be massively high so that it's dangerous. Like it's more... I'm more concerned with that change of direction. And then if we're talking about danger and injury, like there's also no reason why you can't just get someone to do verticals. Mm. Like you don't have to jump to a box. Like I think people, when they're trying to train jumping, fall into the trap of thinking that they have to jump onto something um, rather than just doing a vertical jump. Well, there's a certain safety to jumping onto something as well because you're Because there's landing. no landing in a poor yeah. position. Yeah, correct, yeah. Um, but, then we're, but then if we talk about doing a depth jump, like yeah, and then that, we're dropping a off a height, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I think box jumps, good, use them, um, probably don't need to all the time, probably in different phases, phases where you're trying to build speed, maybe so, doing low percentage work. So tell me how, like, so for my guys, how would you program box jumps as a, as a gym? Like if you were to obviously write a team program, it's yep. not fully individualized. Mm -hmm. How would you program box jumps uh, into the, into the program? Um, like you have a rough idea of how I do things, so you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so speed work, firstly. So speed work is so at the start a session. At the start a session. Yeah. Uh, speed work at the start a session in a more power low percentage based phase um, for your power lifts. I'm talking about. So like if they're doing like squats at forty to sixty percent, I'm trying to move that a little bit faster, more towards their like clean weights, for example. Um, I would use it at the start of the session for that more pure speed work. So it's very unloaded and it's just purely about how much power output, well not power output, but how much speed you can get through the muscles to take off, right? Like your acceleration. Um, and then I think it can be, I think they're important to use all year round almost. Um, maybe in a phase where you're trying to build speed, it's more important to use it more often um, because I think they are a really important tool for building speed, especially considering the positions are pretty, pretty similar. Like, uh, like joint angles and stuff are pretty close to jump up onto a box as to what it is, for example, to finish your pull. Yeah, even um, the start of a jump is basically the same as your like position two, like from the knee. Yeah, exactly, yeah. It's almost the same as a hang position, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know why I described it like that. <laughs> position two from the <laughs> knee. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... I'm I, trying to be specific. <laughs> I know, um, but I guess, well, hang can be so many places, right? Um, but then I think it can be used in also a strength phase as well, even just for, because speed work or trying to be fast requires so much neurological effort as well, um, like so much CNS firing, I think it can even just be used as a primer as well. Like people come in and they're not necessarily ready to just chuck big weight on the bar straight away, get them to do some jumps. They're generally pretty awake after doing some jumps, um, pretty ready to go as well. Yeah. Well, at least falling will wake you up. Falling will definitely <laughs> wake you up. <laughs> um, so, like, a stock sets and reps. Like, how how would you like? I'm, I I actually want help with this. Because power power range. So, um, there's some new research talking about like when programming power. Um, or, I guess when we talk about speed, like if we're talking about doing box jumps for speed work in air quotes, then we're really talking about doing power work as well, right? Like we're trying to build power output. 
um, by increasing speed. So mm. you don't need to talk about speed too much. Whereas when you're doing like a squat or something, you're doing power, like if you're working those low ranges. You're working power, but with a strength aspect yes. as well, as opposed to, it doesn't really require that much strength to change direction of your body movement to jump up, right? But the rate at which you can do it is what dictates how high you can jump. Yes. Yeah. Um, because what we're doing with the, so like when you look at uh, squat or deadlift or whatever, we're looking at force, when you're looking at Jumping, uh, jumping, looking at speed. speed yeah. And then when we're looking at Olympic lifting, you're looking at both, yeah. right, together. Um, but at the same time, that's sport specific, it's yeah. dynamic, so there's a few other things going Correct. on as well. Yeah. So what I would suggest is the same ranges that they talk about when talking about doing power work. So depending on the sport, so some of the new research in maybe the last three or four years talks about single effort versus multi-effort or single bout versus multi-bout sports. So if you're talking about, say, we won't talk about it too much, but if you're talking about rugby union, rugby league, field sports, generally they're a multi-bout sport because there's a lot more efforts repeatedly happening. So you talk about doing a slightly higher rep range. So power work for them is maybe more between like a three to six range rather than what we talk about in a single bout where it should really stay between one to three. Um, and whether that be Olympic lifts, um, power lifts, or jumps, I think when working that power work, you should stay between that one to three range. It can be, I think if you don't do it all the time, you need to start really small with total reps, total volume of the session. Um, but then just because it is such an explosive movement, you really can't afford to throw tendons into that much quick reactive movement too early, like it is something that needs to be built up to. But once you've been doing it for a little while, like ones, twos, threes, between 15 and 30 jumps in a session would be adequate, I think. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily, I mean, from my slightly uneducated point of view, I don't necessarily agree with people like Louis, for example, like when he talks about you got to do between 40 and 80 jumps a week in probably, he talks about doing two jump sessions where he does 40 in both sessions. Yeah. I don't think you need to do 80 jumps a week. And I certainly don't think you need to do 40 in a session. Um, well, especially not far off 30, would you recommend it, right? No, but I'm, talk I'm not necessarily talking about doing it every day, like ah, doing yeah. it twice a day, like I'm saying... Wait, like, does he say you have to jump twice a day? No, twice jump a twice a week, yeah, twice yeah. a week, yeah. Um, so 30 is that top range, mm. right? And I also wouldn't even really get people to jump. I would get people to jump twice a week, but it would be maybe like, for example, if I was going to program for Jack, let's say I'm programming for Jack, um, maybe on a Monday before he does his cleans, he jumps... Um, he does like 15 sets of two jumps to a relatively low box for 30 reps, which is 30 reps um, before he cleans. And then maybe on Friday before he snatches, he does 10 sets of, or 15 sets of one jump to a slightly higher with a little bit more rest as yeah. well. Um, so the week volume is still only 45 jumps. Um, at different heights, yes. Um, still for only 45 jumps. It's nowhere near that whole 80 range. I think it's something that can be used sparingly, um, but I also don't think it's something that you can really... I, f I think you're doing yourself a disservice by not jumping. Mm. I think, so for me, like I've always been very good at jumping. Yeah. So you know how you tend when not you to program things yeah. that you're... I mean, you either tend to program a lot of the things you're good at yeah. or tend to program for your it's easy. It's easy to, if you're writing program, especially if you're writing a program that you follow as well. Yeah. It would pro I mean, I don't program for a group of people and myself. Like, I follow a different program to the people I program for. So Because you're better. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I have different strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. Um, but I guess... It would be very. I can imagine it would be very easy to fall into the trap of going, of thinking about the things that you need to work on and prioritizing them, as an over, uh, rather than necessarily looking at the weightlifter as a whole. Is that why my gym squats every day? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and doesn't deadlift ever. Um, also, in saying, uh, not sound like an idiot. I don't think that um, weightlifters need to deadlift anyway. But yeah, so that's my own opinion. I don't think they need to deadlift. I think as long as they pull heavy, they don't need to do a traditional deadlift. Yeah, well, the problem is, so with us, we have, I, and I get that, the, 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 the crux of, of that argument is, one, deadlifts are really heavy, they're hard to recover from, so they take away from the rest of your training. Mm. Um, and that's why people don't like deadlifts, right? 
and then it's too dissimilar to a, oh, well, it's similar enough, but also dissimilar to something like a clean or snatch ball. It's similar enough. It's similar enough to get good strength gains for the snatch of the clean, but I think it's dissimilar enough to, I think what coaches are worried about is poor movement. Yeah. Um, and also, we talk about like, um, what about if people pull sumo? For just pure it's strength? completely dissimilar. Like it's, com it's so far removed that I don't think you're going to have any sort of uh, poor transfer as far as coordination goes. Yeah, that's what I mean. Um, but also, if you're working with people that are good lifters, I don't think, like if I got you to deadlift four times a week, like I never would, but if I got you to deadlift four times a week, I don't really think the fact that you're deadlifting more is going to ruin the coordination of your clean. Yeah. You know what I mean? Unless we stopped cleaning as well. Like you're always going to have, as long as you continue to clean, you're always going to have that good coordination of your clean. I don't think when you've been doing it for so long, you're going to get that same contextual like interference, which is like the interference between movements transferring over to your clean is what you do from your deadlift. Maybe your first rep goes, oh, that felt a little weird, but your positions are probably still right. Wait, so you just brought up an argument and then argued against your own yeah. argument. <laughs> I like arguing both sides of the top. Um, I'm not saying that, I, I guess all I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate to the point where like, I'm saying that I don't think deadlifting all the time is going to affect you negatively. Yeah. Negatively. I just think that you don't necessarily need to deadlift. Yeah, if that's that makes sense. Like, I think that... What if your sport is changing and you're like, you know, like, I, I think we're really enjoying this whole, like, super total thing. So, like, that's a big part of it. Do you think that'll ever go anywhere? The... Well, no, I just like doing it. Oh, for I sure. want a total yeah. of 1,000 uh, kilos. Hmm. I want a total one ton. If I can total a thousand pounds, I'll be happy. A thousand pounds. <laughs> <laughs> but like, how cool would that but be? Actually, to yeah, lift a that, ton no, that'd be five, awesome. Five or six lifts. Oh, well, I guess I can do it over this. No, a thousand pounds. Sorry, two thousand pounds, which is like one ton T O N. Mm. Um, like I think that's a big thing going on ar around in the states at the moment. And it's a massive goal, the one ton challenge kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, but for that's sure. like yeah, like you can do that. I can do that already. Over six lifts or over five? Six lifts. I can do it over six. I definitely can't do it over yeah. five. Um, but like a true ton, which is a thousand kilograms, is mm. actually a lot harder. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Because like yeah. their one ton is what, 2,008 pounds or whatever it is. So it's like... No, it'd be more than that, isn't it? I don't know. It's 2,180. Something like that. Yeah. But it's not a thousand kilos. They're different. No. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, so, it's um, very different. Uh that'll be hard and to do it over five lifts like snatch clean clean and jerk deadlift bench mm. whatever that last one is squat <laughs> that's a lot harder yeah can you hit it over six uh i can hit like a american ton over six 210 400 500 can you over six clean yeah. engine one four. Oh yeah okay yeah yeah I can, like that can you know you? all of my numbers off by heart. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I can. I think I did it at the last one. So if I go... Uh, you did 220? 112. No, my dad's 240. Was it the other day? No. But so I have not. hit it. <laughs> so, so I did it. I hit it at my other comp. I think if you did 240, I think you get it. Yeah. So I've got one, you it. 112, 140, 190, 115, 240. That's definitely over. I don't, know, I don't know maths. I'm not gonna do that in my head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it is over. Yeah, but I don't think it's over by heaps. But it is over. Yeah. It's See, I definitely can't heaps. get it because I can't deadlift that. I can't deadlift heavy enough. Yeah. Well, you can bench heavy now. Congratulations. I can bench heavy-ish. You can bench heavier than you could before. Yes. Correct. Which is important. Yeah. Hundred um, percent. That's another good question. How much do you think like being able to bench press heavy translates over to a jerk? To a jerk. To a jerk. Probably not much. What about to injury prevention in a jerk? Again, probably not much. Snatch? Uh, probably a bit more. Like, let's say you're, like, super hypermobile on the shoulders. Being able to have a good bench helps yeah. bring the bar back forward. Yeah. But... Okay. So uh, why do you think... Do you think weightlifters need to bench? Well, that, so for men especially, it's not about the overhead, uh, like, problems that, it de that develop. It's actually the front rack problems. From benching too much? Yes. Yeah. Because... Like front rack is, you know, uh, moving your shoulder 
upwards, which is shoulder flexion, and then it's also external rotation of the shoulder. Yeah. And then bench is like... So much internal rotation. So much internal rotation. Yeah. So like people that bench a lot just can't front rack. Yeah. And that yeah. hurts your overhead. From a, well. from a strength point of view though, say, say front rack mobility isn't an issue. Yeah. Say like they're never going to have that issue no matter how strong their bench gets. Do you program benching often? It's like even despite that, I program benching a lot. Yeah. Because I like benching. I want to be able to answer that. How much but do you why? bench and not be like, I don't want to tell you. Uh, <laughs> but what? But outside of an ego thing, why do you program benching? Well, I do think it's important for just general strength okay. and the stability of the shoulder in day to day life. Is it an imbalance thing as well? Just yeah. making sure that people can't like aren't ridiculously strong overhead and obviously pulling their posture back and that sort of thing. Yeah, and it's again, it's like the hex bar deadlift. It's easy to teach. Yeah. Easy to train. Yeah. And it's uh, easy way to track progress. What's I think I've heard you talk about it on here before, but for my own knowledge, what's the? Isn't there? Is there a percentage transfer from horizontal to vertical? I've heard someone talk about it before, where like, um, as an average, like if you improve your bench 10 kilos, I think like maybe your vertical press is supposed to go up like 30% or something, like mm. three kilos. I don't think so, especially when you get into like the technical aspects of the bench. So my bench went from like, you know, I, I could hit maybe 100 kilos every week as my minimum, to I could hit that for reps quite easily just by improving my technique. Okay, yeah. the bench like rest. what kind of things? Like just muscle firing? Uh, just like uh, learning how to arch properly, learning how to, learning the um, bar path of a... Uh, proper bench. Of a proper bench, like a competition bench. Yeah. Learning how to use leg drive properly. Yeah. Like the bench is so technical mm. when you talk about it from a sports point of view. Mm. And it, like I can't go back to benching how I used to. Even when I close grip bench now, I'm like, oh, you know, like... I know that the bar, as it comes down, like it comes down straight, but then it actually deviates backwards. And that's how, you Brings know. Brings more shoulders into the movement. Yeah, yeah. and it, it basically, it falls upwards. Yeah, yeah. Which is really weird to explain on a podcast, but if no. you, if oh, you I look at it. I'm looking at you, so I understand what you're talking about. Yeah. But yeah, 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 for sure. So if you learn that, um, that makes a big difference. So people with massive benches that are powerlifters, they could increase that and have no effect on their overhead strength. Yeah, okay. Whereas if you, you know, close grip bench and improve, like you'd be better off doing like Do you specific think things. The, tra the transfer from a bench over to a vertical press is more just through tricep strength improvement, really. Yes, and so th if that was your weakness... So that's why by overhead. close grip benching and your elbows then track closer to the body, that's why that transfers over a lot better. Yeah, so I would say... It, the close grip bench would have a better carryover to a jerk. Okay. Because that'll help with lockout, but it won't necessarily help with the drive. Okay. How important is non-sport specific strength to weightlifting? Like, so, like if we say a powerlifter's grip bench or a slightly wider grip bench doesn't really have a good transfer over to anything really yeah. in weightlifting specific, then are you programming it because you like your athletes to be strong in daily life as well or yes. are you programming it for some other reason well that and injury prevention okay. like we might not have the best like weightlifter weightlifters around mm. but our weightlifters are very strong oh yeah and i'd challenge anyone from most other gyms to come in and challenge jack to some random strength movement like, yeah and that's the thing like we might not be able to like, get him but. snatch clean and jerk at that top level but you give us any strength challenge and we'd have a go. We, yeah. would, we won't be scared of doing anything else. Mm. Whereas Because you, you know, guys do everything already. Yeah. Like, yeah. Because that's the way we train. We train to just be circus animals. Mm. What, did I, what did I used to tell you when I was a kid? Yeah, you want to be a human party trick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way I train these guys too. Yeah. Do you think, um, I guess, do you think it is important from a weightlifting standpoint to train not necessarily poor but odd positions? Um, like, for example, like you like using sandbags or dead balls. Um, do you think that the fact that to pick up a sandbag or a dead ball, you need to get to that slightly like rounded back position to actually pick it up? Do you think that is beneficial to an injury prevention standpoint? Like yeah. when someone rounds in a pool or? I think, I think that that sort of stuff is beneficial yeah. and helpful and fun and all that. Um, 
I wouldn't go so far as to program things like round back deadlifts, round no, back, yeah, yeah. Uh, unless they, they, unless it called for it. Like there was a specific instance. Like what's an instance? I don't know. Maybe someone has uh, some sort of lower back injury, mm -hmm. and or like let's say their lower back is in spasm. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes things like Jefferson curls and stuff. More of a stretching help. mobility yeah. movement. So like they're not loading it with like hundreds of kilos, mm. but it calls for you know, moving through those ranges so that the body understands, hey, you know, like, you can calm down. Mm. You don't have to be in spasm all the time. Mm -hmm. Would you, if you, for example, like we see a lot of time, I think, and I think it's poor coaching from the start um, when they're first learning, like, I prefer myself to see someone deadlift with a flat back. Yeah. Yeah, um, whereas I think a lot of people get taught, whether if it's just poor cues. The super arch? The super arch, yeah, and yeah. to really hyperextend through the lumbar rather than trying to keep the lumbar fairly straight and mm. just, or at least just maintain that natural curve that it has. Um, if you're trying to teach someone to come out of that hyperextension, what sort of things are you focusing on? Like, is there an imbalance? Like, if it's someone, for example, that has like a lordosis, is it an imbalance there that you're trying to fix, or is it a coaching cue of like, let's like lift the pelvis at the front, like get a posterior tilt going on, try and flatten out that back a little bit more? I think it's a bit of everything you just described. Okay. Um, it's something that I'm working with a lot of athletes right now. Like m my mom is really bad. Yeah. Like she has like a over exaggerated lordotic curve. Yeah. And then when she deadlifts, instead of locking out the hips, she will lock out the through, lumbar through the lumbar. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's I something think that, that I see that a lot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like in my mom or just in no, general? In general. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's something that we're working on really closely. So for mom, we're thinking about length through the thorax. Yeah. Because if she can lengthen through her thorax itself, mm. then she's not feeling compressed and having to lock out that way. Mm. And then obviously uh, working on a bit of that pelvic tilt. But then for someone like Claire, Claire actually pulls her snatches and Sutherland? stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like Claire pulls her snatches like that. And that's something that we're working on too. Yeah. Like, have you seen her snatch and stuff? Yeah, like she's she, got a big arch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she arches through that. And then as she extends to jump, Mm. her hips will come back through mm. and that kind of uncontrolled motion will probably cause an issue later on so we're mm. trying to work on that and we're, we're mm. using like breath cues and length cues rather than like think mm. about tilting your pelvis because it happens fast it's hard to think about those things yes yeah it's yeah it's hard to coordinate it's especially hard to coordinate under load um especially because the muscles that are involved in moving the pelvis around are not necessarily the strongest muscles in the body. Yeah. Like, you can't expect them to do much under a 200 kilo load. No, and, and w when, like, so with mom, we're doing, like, light deadlifts, and as soon as she, she like, she can go heavy, but yeah. as soon as it looks bad, we're like, no, you're done. done. Yeah. Uh, with Claire, she's doing, like, a lot of sl slow pulls. So, yeah. she, like, she'll pull slowly to the hip, and then once she gets there, she's allowed to move, move fast, because she's yeah. got to that position already. So she, Yeah, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I guess where I was sort of leading into that is when we're talking about like not how you don't do round back deadlifts and that sort of thing. If you had someone with a massive lordosis, would you allow them to try and move into more of a round back position to pull it forward or not really? Like exaggerate to fix it. You know, the cue might be let's try and pull with a round back, mm. but is that necessarily what we're looking for? Maybe not. I just yeah. food for thought. Asking yeah, like I'm, I'm running through this in my head too. Like what yeah. would you do? Uh, I wouldn't program a round back deadlift. Yeah. Um, but I also don't think it's necessarily safe to continue to deadlift with that hyper arch either. Because mm. um, I kind of pull a little bit like that too, like in my with that hyper arch. Yeah. Yeah. In my snatches and clean jerks. CrossFit's been horrible for both of us with that. Yeah. Um, and especially like. Um, what well, the theory wasn't there when we were learning. No. Right? And also what you said with. Um, locking out through the lumbar rather yeah. than locking out through the hips. That's also something that I think is rife through even weightlifting from people that have come from CrossFit or like true CrossFitters and stuff because it's so movement standard based where people are like, show me that you've locked out. So yeah. it's that like, Exaggerate. oh, I'm trying to lock out, throw my hips forward and lean back um, It's my lumbar. It's actually really cool. Like, if you, So watching like good powerlifters do the powerlifting movements is so impressive to watch because you can see that the end position of a deadlift, though it's locked out, is 
exaggerated in completely different ways. Mm. You'll see that there's this, I, it's hard to say nice, but like there's a nice kyphotic curve through the upper back. Yeah. And like the shoulders are rounded forward yeah. so that that bar isn't actually having to travel that far. Yeah, and for sure. And then the... Well, a good powerlifter can deadlift with a rounded upper back, right? Yeah. Um, they, they're completely locked out, but then that lower back is just straight. Yeah. You know, at the, at the top position. Which is really hard to do, mm. right? Like without awesome training for it to be able to deadlift a load with a kyphotic upper back but still either a flat or slightly arched lower back. For sure. Um, and like generally yeah, where the top goes, the bottom tends to follow, right? Like, yeah. So it requires a lot of coordination and strength, I guess, to avoid that. How are we on for time? Um, we're at one fourteen. So what time do we start? I think it's what? What's the time now? One forty. Oh, cool. So we'll wrap it up here. Yeah, cool. Um, Beautiful. That was pretty actually fun to yeah. do. <laughs> that was cool. Yeah, I um, enjoyed that. We actually, um, as opposed to the last one, got on a little bit more of a role talking about stuff that interests both of us interests both of us yeah it was good it was fun where can people find you steve uh steve norman 250 on instagram um i don't post much at all but if you want to have a look you can feel free <laughs> and guys you can find raw barbell club at raw barbell club on all of our social medias so that's instagram facebook youtube and all of that make sure you follow our instagram for cool stories and whatnot are you not on twitter we are, but <laughs> does anyone in Australia use Twitter? I don't know, but I hear it on a lot of podcasts. Yeah, so. <laughs> I used to say we are on Twitter, but I haven't posted on Twitter for a long time. Uh, okay. I'm on like some really, really like uh, niche in, uh, social medias with Raw Barbell that no one would even know about. Are you still on MySpace? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Follow us on MySpace. <laughs> Just in case it comes back. <laughs> um, hopefully you're either listening to this on whatever podcast app you love or you're watching this on YouTube, um, make sure you f subscribe to us on YouTube so you and click that notification bell thingy and you'll be able to see when the new ones come out. Mm -hmm. And what else? Oh, guys, we have a gym. Come in, mm. hit us up to train. Uh, you can obviously go train with Steve too if you want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can come train with me at a CrossFit gym if you want. <laughs> um, and if you really love this podcast, make sure you share it with your friends and please donate because making this podcast is a lot of fun, but it does cost us a lot of money and we're trying to do some really cool things in the future with travel and all of that. So that'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you to everyone who's already donated. You can find that link in the description or go to www.rawbarbellclub.com forward slash donate. Thank you guys so much for listening and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Wow, what an awesome episode. If you liked that episode, I really think you might like this one. And if you want to search for more episodes, guys, click this little circle thing right here. If you want to stay notified, make sure to click that subscribe button below and 